In this video, I'm going to show you how to do one of my favorite quantum electrodynamics calculations, and it is deriving the tree level differential scattering cross section for molar scattering. Personally, I think the formula that we actually ultimately get is quite pretty, and also it's one of the first things that I derived in quantum field theory when I was first learning it, so I have sort of a warm association with it. Apart from that, it's a pretty standard application of the Feynman rules and of the general differential scattering cross section formula for two particles scattering off to yield some number of outgoing particles. It's definitely a good exercise and some fun math. The only tricky thing is simplifying down the trig expression at the end, but I'll show you how to do that. So let's get on to the math section. Let's get going with the tree level molar differential scattering cross section calculation in quantum electrodynamics. Molar scattering is one of the coolest basic scattering processes in quantum electrodynamics. It just consists of two electrons scattering off of each other, however despite its simplicity I think it's particularly cool because the tree level differential scattering cross section has kind of a pretty form to it, and it is also one of the first truly famous results that I ever derived in quantum field theory. In this video I will show you how to derive the tree level molar differential scattering cross section. Of course one could always expand on the tree level with loop diagrams, but that is significantly more complicated. It isn't usually done until long after students have computed the tree level result. The tree level result in calculations like this just reproduces the classical answer despite the fact that we are using quantum field theory machinery to compute it. One only gets quantum corrections from perturbative quantum field theory if loops are included. The expansion in the loop number is also an expansion in powers of Planck's constant and therefore represents an expansion of the quantum corrections. Ignoring them would therefore naturally just leave us with the classical result. Let's now get into the actual calculation. At the tree level, we have the following Feynman diagrams for molar scattering, these two. The only difference between them is the ordering of the outgoing electrons. As usual, solid lines are fermion lines and wavy lines are photon lines. In this case, all of the fermion lines are electron lines, as is shown by the forward in time arrows, including only the ones that are relevant to the tree level. The QED Feynman rules are these. The Feynman rules that are relevant to just loops concern mostly how to integrate momentum variables when loops are present. There is a link in the description to a video where I show how to derive the complete set of Feynman rules for QED. Beyond these pictorial Feynman rules, there is one other important one that we must remember for this case, and that is that there is a relative minus sign generated by an interchange of fermion lines. This means that when we write out the Feynman amplitude terms corresponding to the two diagrams just given, we must make sure that they have a relative minus sign. Expressed in terms of the Feynman amplitude, the general formula for the differential scattering cross-section of two fermions producing some number number of fermions is this formula. There is a link in the description for a video where I show how to derive this general formula. This calculation will have several distinct stages. First, we will simplify the general differential scattering cross-section formula as much as we can without knowing the Feynman amplitude. Second, we will use the Feynman rules to write out the Feynman amplitude. Third, we will take the absolute square of the Feynman amplitude and then spend a lot of time simplifying it. Fourth, we will construct a parameterization of the momentum four vectors and insert it into the squared Feynman amplitude. Fifth, we will use some complicated trig identities to simplify the parameterized expression down. At the very end, we will insert the simplified squared Feynman amplitude into the pre-simplified differential scattering cross-section formula to obtain the final answer, the molar differential scattering cross-section formula. Lastly, we will take the ultra-relativistic and non-relativistic limits of this result. The center of mass frame will be assumed for this calculation. For most of the calculation, we don't make use of this fact. It is applied only to twice in the next section, but towards the end, a specific parameterization based on this reference frame is constructed and used to obtain the final answer. This is the parameterization that I mentioned in the last paragraph. The first thing we will do in this section is insert the momentum variables written in the Feynman diagrams into the differential scattering cross section. We can see from the above diagrams that we only have two outgoing particles, so the immediate result will be simpler than the starting point. Beyond this, the standard result also includes averaging over the incoming electron spins and summing over the outgoing electron spins, so we need to insert such averages and sums on the absolute squared Feynman amplitude into the differential scattering cross section. Doing all of this to the formula given 
given in the introduction easily gives us this result. You may notice that I added a 6 superscript to the differential on sigma. This is to indicate how many differentials there are on the other side of the equation. This number will drop as we complete phase space integrations over some of the momentum and energy variables. The standard molar differential scattering cross-section is with respect to the solid angle of one of the outgoing electrons. Therefore, one of the things that we will need to do in preparing a differential scattering cross-section formula is integrate over the other momentum variables. It turns out this can be done before we have worked out the Feynman amplitude because of the delta functions that show up in the cross-section formula. They are there to impose energy and momentum conservation. Therefore, we can do the necessary phase space integrations without knowing the Feynman amplitude as long as we take the energy and momentum conservation relations to be true for the Feynman amplitude, which depends on those variables. It turns out that these relations are extremely useful in simplifying the absolute square of the Feynman amplitude. I chose to integrate over P2 to begin with. This is the first step in getting the differential scattering cross-section with respect to the solid angle of the P1 electron. This is an arbitrary choice. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Because of the momentum conservation delta function, integrating over P2 just provides us with this result and, of course, enforces this mechanical momentum conservation relation. The next step is to put the remaining differential in spherical coordinates. This is necessary because it explicitly reveals a solid angle differential that we want to write the differential scattering cross-section with respect to. Doing this provides us with this result. Therefore, the final integration that we must perform to get the differential scattering cross-section with respect to the solid angle is this one, where we have these two formulas describing the dependence of these two energy terms on the variable we're integrating over, where these are just constants in that variable. And I obtain this relation here from the fact that we're in the center of mass reference frame. This is the first of the two ways we apply the fact that we're in the center of mass reference frame before we get to the end of the calculation and we pick our parameterization. We can use the standard identity to rewrite the energy conservation delta function in an easy to integrate form, specifically like this, where f prime is the derivative of this function in the argument there, and p1 prime magnitude naught is the root of the f function, or the true value of p1 prime magnitude, the one that satisfies energy conservation. Integrating over the delta function causes this relation to be enforced, and through that, this energy conservation relation. We can then relabel the actual momentum with the symbol previously just used for the integration variable to make the notation simpler, and this doesn't cause a problem because we've just finished the integration. It gave us this result here, where f prime works out to be that. It is worth pointing out that the superscript on the differential is usually dropped. It was useful to keep track of things while we were doing the integration, but it is no longer needed, so we'll drop it. Therefore, we have this result. Keep in mind that because of the integrations that we did, d sigma doesn't mean what it did in the general formula in the introduction before we did any of the integrations. If we insert the value of f prime, we get this result. We see that nice cancellation yielding this. Then we can use energy conservation to replace this quantity here with this one. It's split on the line there to write the differential scattering cross-section like this. Now here we get to the second application of our assumption that we're in the center of mass frame before the end of the calculation, and that is to rewrite this quantity like that, which ultimately gives us this result for the differential scattering cross-section, simplified as much as we're going to before we actually plug in the Feynman amplitude. Now we must actually compute the Feynman amplitude. The next step is to use the Feynman diagrams and rules given in the introduction to write down the Feynman amplitude. Two different Feynman diagrams contribute at the tree level, so we have two different terms in the Feynman amplitude. If we look at the first diagram and the Feynman rules, we get this result for the Feynman amplitude contribution of the first diagram. We can then look at the second diagram and use the Feynman rules to write out its contribution to the Feynman amplitude, and we get this result. Therefore, the total Feynman amplitude for the tree-level molar scattering cross-section in quantum electrodynamics is simply this two-term expression. In this particular calculation, there isn't really any more simplification to be done before the Feynman amplitude is squared, so that's what we'll do next. Of course, if we're going to square this, we have to take the complex conjugate of a scalar that is a rather complicated product of matrices and vectors, so it perhaps isn't as trivial as one might immediately think. However, there is an identity for doing this that makes our job pretty easy. The identity consists of complex conjugating the prefactor, flipping the spinners, and reversing the order of the sandwiched matrices. The Feynman amplitude terms and their complex conjugates are given here, so you can see how that identity works. We can then now write out the square because we've got the complex conjugates as well as the original Feynman amplitude. Specifically, we just need to plug them into this formula. 
it's worth actually simplifying it down separately in four terms. Handling this first term here, if we plug in the Feynman amplitude term that's relevant and its complex conjugate, we get to here. And we can simplify a little bit by bringing some factors out. And the next thing we can do is we can reorder some of these scalar factors to optimize it for the next step, which involves inserting traces over scalars, which you can do without changing anything because they're scalars, but then that allows you to take advantage of the cyclic property of the trace productively to set it up for use of this identity, which we can then plug in to get here. Given that the only difference between the two Feynman amplitude terms is a flipped sign and flipped outgoing momentum variables, we can derive a similar expression for the fourth term in the square by simply making the those changes to the above result for the first term. The sign flip cancels. Doing this gives us this answer. Next, the same process can be performed on the cross terms in the square. So this is the first cross term. Plugging in the relevant Feynman amplitude term and the relevant complex conjugate gets us there. We can simplify by bringing some factors out. Then we can reorder scalar factors to set it up for taking the trace very productively. And then we can take advantage of the cyclic property of the trace to get here. And we can apply this identity again, which gets us down to this. And then we can use the same interchange to get the second cross term from the first cross term, which gives us this result. So then plugging all that in, gets us this nasty expression, which we can rewrite slightly more compactly like this. Then to simplify this further, we need to actually compute these traces. This first trace here can be quite easily computed. If we pull out the denominators, we get to here, and then multiplying it out gives us this. And then we can split up the trace into a sum of traces, which gets us here. Then traces of products of odd numbers of gamma matrices are zero, which gets us here. Then we can do these two traces separately using common gamma matrix identities. Doing that gets us this result and that one. Plugging them back in gets us to this answer for this trace that we wanted. And if we scroll back up to the original expression, we see that this trace is essentially exactly the same. The only differences that we see are there's a two in the subscript on the momentum vectors and the indices and the gamma matrices are raised. Those are changes we can easily make and get the simplified result right away from that one. We can then contract the two and calculate that product. And we can actually simplify it down a little bit further than this using momentum conservation. If we square this and then simplify and then rearrange it in two different ways and square and simplify, we get these three relations, which we can use to simplify this down to that. And then we can apply momentum conservation again directly to these last two terms to simplify their sum down to this. Inserting that gives us this final result. Then, of course, if we scroll back up to this formula right here, we see that if we have this term here, we must have another similar term with reversed external momenta, given that right there. So we can get that simply by performing that momentum interchange, and that gets us this result. Then we can start working on the first cross term. If we pull out the denominator factors and then multiply it out completely, we get here. And then we remember again that traces of products of odd numbers of gamma matrices are zero. So it simplifies down to this. Then we can write that in terms of a total of eight different traces given here, which we can then simplify down with these gamma matrix identities here. Let's take a look at how T1 works. First, I pulled out all the momentum vectors by writing everything in index notation. And then I took advantage of these identities that tell us how to write contracted products of gamma matrices like that to simplify this product of eight gamma matrices down to a product of six, and then finally down to a product of two, and then we've got an identity for evaluating traces of those. And then we can write it in terms of dot products instead of index notation, which gives us this result. Then for the other traces, the process is essentially identical. I've written out the algebra in case you get stuck. Inserting all those results gets us to here, and then simplifying a little bit gets us to here. Then we can apply momentum conservation and simplify quite a bit, where we take advantage of those same identities that we were working with above, and ultimately we get down to here. So this is really quite a simple result. Again, I've written out the algebra steps to help you through in case you've gotten stuck. So this is our final answer for that trace. Then we know there must be another term with a numerator like this in the overall expression because we had that plus interchange thing at the end of the last expression. So we can perform that interchange on it to get this result for that trace. And then we can plug all those results back into the squared Feynman amplitude to get this quantity. Throughout this calculation so far, we have escaped picking a specific parameterization for the momentum vectors. All that we needed was to remember that we were taking the center of mass frame. And even then, this fact was only applied twice 
to simplify the scattering cross-section formula at the end of the second section. To simplify the result any further, a specific parameterization must be selected. Figure 1 illustrates the center of mass frame in a manner that makes this task easy. So looking at this diagram, we can write down this standard parameterization for the center of mass frame for particles of equal mass. We can then evaluate all the momentum variable dependent quantities in the squared Feynman amplitude, and that gets us these results. These are the quantities that are relevant to the numerator, and these are the quantities that show up in the denominator. We can now plug all this into the differential scattering cross-section in the squared Feynman amplitude. The differential scattering cross-section formula simplifies down nicely to that, and we get this crazy messy thing for the squared Feynman amplitude. Figuring out how to simplify the Feynman amplitude square without help is rather hellish given the complicated dependence on trig functions. However, it is quite easy if someone tells you which algebraic steps to take and which trig identities to use. Here follows exactly that explanation. The key to simplifying this is to manipulate the expression until one can make use of these trig identities. So we want to manipulate this thing, this messy thing, whose simplification is very much non-obvious until these can be applied, and then we can simplify much more trivially from there. This is that last expression we had for the squared Feynman amplitude that we're starting with. The first step in getting the squared amplitude into the form where these trig identities are applicable is to factor the first two denominators, so we arrive at this. Then we can factor out this factor from all of the denominators, so we arrive here. We can then factor the last terms in the first two numerators to arrive at this result. These first two fractions can then be split into separate terms, giving us this. We can then bring these two terms to the front and add and subtract this quantity. The added copy can be combined with the last term, that's why we get a factor of 3 there. And the subtracted one can be placed as a third term there. Then we can factor this quantity out from the first three terms, which gives us this expression here. We can then apply this identity from above, which simplifies what's in here down to that, quite simply. Then we can factor this quantity out completely from the expression, getting us here. And now, not all of it, but the majority of the remaining simplification will just be in these curvy parentheses, the big ones. We can then factor out this factor from these first two terms, which gets us here. And we can also evaluate these squares in those two numerators, which gets gets us to here. Then we can split these up into separate terms and isolate the rest of the trig functions that we want to make substitutions for. Doing that gets us to this. Then we can apply these other four trig identities that were in the list at the beginning that consisted of five total, one of which we've already applied. Inserting them gets us to here. We can then refactor everything in the large curvy parentheses based on the sine function power multiplying the term. Doing that gets us to here. We can simplify the numerator of the second term in the large parentheses down to that. And we can also rewrite these terms there as a perfect square, so we arrive at that. Then we can also recognize that this numerator on the first term in these large curvy parentheses is also a perfect square, so that gets us to here. And then we can rewrite this quantity in the numerator on that middle term like this. So not a perfect square, but at least it's useful for our next step. Inserting that in gets us to this expression. And then we see we have this term here, which can be combined with this one, given that this will cancel that factor in the numerator. So that gets us to here. Then we see we can factor out this factor here from both terms in these large parentheses to get to this, as well as a factor of 2. Then we can pull a factor of 2 out of everything to get to here. Then we can divide both sides by a factor of e to the fourth, which gets us to this. And then we can insert it into the differential scattering cross-section formula right here, which gives us this, the molar differential scattering cross-section formula. The pretty nature of the formula is one of the reasons why it's my favorite. If we take the ultra-relativistic limit, this is the limit where mass goes to zero, then we ultimately get this result here. And now we can take the non-relativistic limit. Of course, in this limit, the denominator of the prefactor goes to zero and the prefactor diverges. However, this isn't actually that relevant to taking the limit because it multiplies the whole expression. We only care to figure out which terms become insignificant relative to the others as E approaches M. No prefactor, even a divergent one, affects the relative significance of the terms. With this in mind, we can see that the last term in the general formula gets very small compared to the first two. So we have this result, and then we can remember that non-relativistic physics P equals MV, which simplifies it down to this result. And that completes our analysis of molar scattering and quantum electrodynamics at the tree level.
Scrolling back up to the beautiful main result, this is probably what you came here for, but I also showed you how to take some important limits of this result. So now you know how to derive the tree level differential scattering cross section for molar scattering in quantum electrodynamics, starting with nothing but the general differential scattering cross section formula and the QED Feynman rules. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Get trick out.